Amber Tamblin is an author, actor, and director. She's been nominated for an Emmy, Golden Globe, and Independent Spirit Award for her work in television and film, including House, Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants, and many others. Most recently, she wrote and directed the feature film Paint It Black. She is the author of three books of poetry, including the critically acclaimed bestseller Dark Sparkler, and a novel, Any Man. I think I saw some copies of that really fantastic, provocative novel in the back there, so check that out if you, if you aren't familiar. And she is a contributing writer for the New York Times. But she's here tonight to discuss her latest book, Era of Ignition, Coming of Age in a Time of Rage and Revolution, uh, a title that gives me a lot of pause, but also a lot of powerful hope. Rage and Revolution is something I'm really excited to hear on the stage tonight. So please join me in giving a warm town hall welcome to Amber Tamblin. Hi, you guys. How are you? Um, thanks for coming out tonight. What is today? I don't know. Who am I? I don't know anything anymore. Um, book tours tend to, to do that to you, make you a little uh, loopy in the head. Um, I took three flights to get here today from Madison, Wisconsin, where I ate a lot of cheese, as one does. Um, I love Seattle so much. This is one of my favorite cities in the country, and um, uh, so I'm just I'm very happy to be here and and to um, to be back here with Town Hall, who's put this amazing event together. Um, so I guess I'm going to read you a little bit from this book, and then I thought I would just sort of open it up to anyone in the audience, and we can have a conversation. Um, this book looks at a lot of my life in the entertainment business, looks at a, a lot of um, my experiences growing up as an actress and sort of working through some of my own personal existential crisis in my early 20s and my mid-20s, um, while also sort of realizing that a lot of that was happening during a time right now when our country is going through one of its own. So... Some of the themes that it touches on, it talks a lot about the formation of Time's Up, um, a lot about uh, 2017's Me Too movement, which is what I refer to it because um, for anyone who's not, a, not uh, fully fam familiar, it was actually a movement that started over two decades ago by the activist Tarana Burke. Um, so in this iteration of it and what that has looked like for all of us cumulatively um, in our individual lives, in our personal lives, um, in our professional lives or, you know, across every stratosphere of who we are. Uh, it really feels like right now that the, um, that our culture, that our foundation as a nation has been ripped up from the ground and sort of tossed around. And there's, there's a real sense of like a condensed chaos. I don't know if you guys all feel that, but I, I have felt it for many years now, certainly since Donald Trump was elected. So, um, so this book sort of covers all of that, but I think more than just talking about this palpable rage, more than just talking about what we have all experienced in the last several years, it, what I, it, I hope that it offers a proactive way to move forward with that rage, with those feelings, with this sense of, um, uh, you know, trajectory that we are all having right now, um, so, uh, so the book aims to, to give us some ideas about how to not only think about how we are existing in this world, what we are doing to change it, to create more representation, to create more space for other voices to be not only heard, but um, counted and um, uh, considered important and worthy, um, but to, to also remember how we in our own capacities sometimes are complicit even when we don't mean to do that. And what do we do? What do we do when we fail? Um, and I make a big argument in the book that failure is not the problem. No one here failing or fucking up is the problem. No one anywhere doing that is the problem. The problem is not trying. The problem is not being a part of the greater good and the greater conversation that needs to happen and needs to take place and is taking place whether we like it or not. And that it will always be uncomfortable and there is nothing we can do to not let it be uncomfortable. It is supposed to be uncomfortable. So my whole thing is to lean into that and, and know that it's going to be okay because out of chaos comes clarity.
I was the seasoned soap opera starlet, the incidental ingenue, the accidental adolescent actress turned adult apparition, haunting her own future by existing only in her past. I was the famous one, known for being unknown. I was an ideological in-between, a neither here nor there artist taken seriously by few outside of the poetry community and even fewer within it. I was the girl who was a blind spot in the mirrors of powerful men, the girl called upon to help rewrite, workshop, or give notes on scripts, uh, or give notes on scripts by men as an assumed favor, only to never be hired by them or receive any credit. I was the secret weapon for everyone else's arsenals but my own. I was the girl lost amid privilege and invisibility, forever seen as for what I used to be, not for who I am. That was me. That was me in the form of fading fire. And then that girl, that starlet, that in-between, that some-bodied nobody, that fading fire was extinguished. The woman who emerged was done, was done not just with not being believed, but also with not being listened to, taken seriously, heard, seen, counted, or chosen for the job. She was done with the doing of others, of being a Cyrano for male cisness, consistently asked by peers in positions of power to help them remain there without any reciprocity or consideration given. I was done with selling myself short so that men could buy themselves success. And if someone with the access, privilege, and reach that I grew up with was feeling this way, I could only imagine what the less well-connected members of the even more greatly underrepresented communities in my industry were feeling. What has been reborn in me is being reborn in every woman across the country. My Saturn return, my soul's dizzying upheaval, my identity's eruption, my trajectory's crisis, my raw dawning was mirroring the country's Saturn return and its own dizzying upheaval, its identity's eruption, its trajectory's crisis, its raw dawning. We are a nation that is morally backpedaling, scared of change, and stuck in the back pocket of social media's isolation and alienation. We are a nation that not only refuses to resolve matters face to face, we refuse to see eye to eye. We're not only lost, we're just now coming to terms with the fact that we have always been lost. And finding ourselves and others will take more than just strength, it will take stamina. This is the age of action, this era of ignition. We are a collective cognition's fired up engine, revving into revelation, unsure of where we're going, but knowing we can no longer stay where we have been. The question all parents ask themselves is, what kind of world have I brought my child into? I wonder if my own mother ever felt that way about me. I recently texted her during a bout of depression and asked, Mom, when you were pregnant with me, did you ever think to yourself, what kind of world am I bringing this poor girl into? My mother responded by saying, no. We were delighted to have you. There was hope then, especially for environmental concerns. But now we have reached the fatal tipping point that many scientists warned us about. As a species, we have fouled the nest. Now it's about adapting and building supportive villages. We might get lucky and some brilliant team can invent a carbon capture technology. But we will be fine. Marlo will be fine. Many good years left to live. Take heart. And while I have no idea what that uh, survivalist malarkey about carbon capture technology was all about, I really don't. I mean, I feel like you guys will totally get it. My mom is like a very straight-up Southern California hippie. <laughs> um, I did understand her and feel relief from her words. As a new mother to my daughter, Marlo, I have been no different in my fears. But I've started to focus like my mother focuses, 
Less on the world I have brought my daughter into and more on the world I will be leaving for her by fighting to change it. It is a test of true perseverance. After having Marlowe, I was thrust from my own self-centered wallowing into a sort of permanent projectile optimism. As difficult as things are and as impossible as that sounds, I am not without what sometimes feels like supernatural hope, the sorcery of promise, the magic of making it so. I try to visualize the world's transformation and see my daughter as something budding from its abundance, not suffering in its stagnancy. Every quaking nerve, every rattled premonition, every fear for the future propels my indignation into action. And my daughter carries within her now that sparked gene. But while she is of my being, she does not belong to me. And her freedom from my physical body presents a terrifying fact most parents face. I cannot control her safety. There is ultimately nothing I can do to fully protect her from this world. And so instead of worrying about that all the time, which I do, I aim to change the world instead. I know it's a wholly unreasonable desire, but it is the only choice I've got that any of us have. The world I want to give her will be safe and fair and representative of all bodies, not just the ones that look like her own. It will be wild and riveting, full of tender wonder and sometimes failure. It will be intentioned and imperfect, but not imbalanced. And it will still be complicated, unfair at times, and disappointing. The world will be a ferocious verse sung into a universe of similar songs. It will be filled with more possibility than passivity, more empathy than sympathy. The world I want to give her will be a leap into the riot of her own imagination. I want her to see with as much desire as she longs to be seen, to listen to others with as much focus as she longs to be heard. I want her to never have to be afraid to be in a room alone with someone, whether for work or for love. The world I want to give her has no mirrors to bully her frame, no scales meant to shame her size, no culture nurtured to reject her voice. It will love her unabridged, and it will teach her to respect others uncategorically. The world I want to give Marlow is the one we are living in, reborn. One that is nourished, healed, and flourishing. One that is courageous, compassionate, and full of grace. One that is done with the vortex of harm's haunting. Done with the celebrated parades of pain and the sick cyclicality of American callousness. I want to give her a world where love is a given and innocence is not a virtue to be taken. A world of her choosing, not a world already chosen. I want this for your children, too. And for our universe's children, most especially for our planet Earth and her sister in solidarity, Saturn, whose big, bruising, everlasting return will f forever be felt by us as long as humans are living I want our children to grow up in unison, but each with their own individual uniquenesses, like the atoms of water in a river, unpredictable, independent, charged, and free. I can see it now, my daughter's entire life on the horizon, like a sun glaring on the glass of the ocean's surface, her waves impermanent, her salt spectacular, the body of her owning the moon's pole. I can see it now, my girl's trajectory of curiosity, kindness, and dignity, vibrating alongside every other drop of human life. See them and speak to them with me now, our children and their futures, the children of our friends and family, flooding with actualization, reverberating all the light we have ever relit, and all the births we will ever gift. Thank you.
question. So that's the end of the book. Um, I feel like I, there's actually an epilogue, which I was going to read to you guys tonight, but I think, I think I'll, I'll save that for your hearts and your heads when you're reading it alone, which is a letter to my daughter. And there's just not enough fucking Kleenex in this room. But it's interesting, when I wrote um, Any Man, that the novel that's here, there's quite a spoiler at the end of it. There's quite a thing that happens at the end, not a spoiler. And um, so I never got to read that um, when I was touring with that book. So this is my revenge. I'm reading the end of this book only. That's not true. I flip around in it. Um, I feel like that gives like a nice, a little bit of a context, but there is... Pretty much there's no conversation that's off limits, whether that's, you know, how do we talk to our partners, especially our husbands, our brothers, our coworkers who might be men, um, um, or even some problematic women we might work with or who might be in our family. How do we talk to them? How do we, you know, deal with this rage or these feelings that we are having right now amidst all of this um, uh, seismic change? Um, also looking, there's a whole chapter that looks at this idea of sisters in solidarity, of uh, the, the most important conversation that's come out of feminism, I think, in any of the waves, which is the conversation surrounding white feminism and uh, the need for white women to own that and to own their failing in, in that. And through that, I think we can have greater conversations about what inclusivity really means and how we can really come to the table and represent the voices of all women. Um, so... Um, there's a lot, there's a lot to, to be had. There's also in the book, you know, I, I have maintained that it is so important to remind our, our men, especially the men in this room, in our lives again, or our work, that feminism, as Bell Hooks famously said, is for everybody and it must be for everybody. And so we need our men to join us in this work and this fight. And there is a space for you. You are important. You matter in the conversation and in the context, and uh, and I give a lot of a, a lot of outlines and in specific, there's like a male manifesto in the book that shows you some very specific ways in which you can move slightly outside of your comfort zone to support um, or be an ally. I feel like the word ally is so overused in my generation, but you know how you can come to our table with us and be a part of the dialogue and be a part of the larger conversation. Because I know a lot of this work can sometimes feel helpless for any of us. We just kind of just feel like we're floundering, right? You're like, well, I know things have to change, but how do we, how do, we do those things? So um, does anybody have any, if you have any questions, you want to raise your hand? This, I feel like I, I'm on Broadway with this spotlight here, so I can't fully see it, but this is a person with their hand up. Here they come, I think, right? And I have no glasses on. That was a miracle. I want to Hi. thank you very much for addressing this malaise that I don't like thinking about, that we're all going through. And you do it in a poetic way, and that's absolutely beautiful. I'm glad you brought up children. I personally, at this point in our nation's history, don't trust anybody over the age of 18. The real ideas, the real strength, the real grit, the real truth is coming from the mouths of children five-year-old children, 10-year-old children. We have, to, we have to ask them, how are we going to fix this? Because they know how to fix it. They're practical. They've had to live through, say they're 12, 13 years old, they had to live through Bush, too. They had to live through W. And that was horrifying for me. I couldn't look at the man. How do we engage, engage with teachers and ask them to really challenge kids and tell them that they do have a voice. How do, we, how do we, parents have got to deal with teachers because they're the ones who are going to form the cultural values mm -hmm. of the children who are young today. How important to you is primary school education to making what you are dreaming come true? Sir, that was a lot of questions. <laughs> I appreciate you very much. Um, the very first thing I want to say, when the Parkland shooting happened and you saw these incredible kids step forward, um, I was so proud of them. 
And I was also really mad at us that we are relying on children to figure things out for us, that we are turning children into our parents, and that we are, we are the kids who can't really seem to get our shit together. I'm not saying anyone in this room, but you know what I'm saying, as adults, as a foundation of adulthood. Um, so it's concerning to me that we keep having to look at the children, even though I agree with you. I mean, the, some of the smartest things have come out of my two-year-old's mouth, and she can barely speak any words yet, but when she does say them, I'm like, that's profound. <laughs> but I think it's important for us to not shirk responsibilities. A lot of this book looks at that, even from the most li liberal, well-meaning, well-intended minds and mouths. How are we complicit how are we not having autonomy over our actions and agency over our own actions? Um, and what is it that we can do to protect our children instead of having to ask them to protect us and teach us how to do those things? Um, the other thing I want to say is that my mother has been a school teacher in public schools in the LA Unified School District for 40 years. So I share your love of teachers and your... Um, your, your need to want to answer all those questions. And I believe that the answer first lies in we need to pay teachers a lot more, a lot more money. Um, I know that personally because I grew up on a teacher's income before I started acting and made my own money. Um, so I know what that feels like. Um, and I know that if teachers had the access and the ability to take care of themselves and their own homes and their own families, there would be a lot more space in education. And certainly, I think, you know, it would, a high tide would lift all boats with those circumstances. So those are, those would be my simple um, answers in a, in a room in a space like this. But that is certainly worth a long conversation. And I, I share those, um, those fears and sentiments with you big time. Anybody else? I'll lock the fucking doors. <laughs> you think you're leaving? You think you guys are going to get your organic chai tea lattes after this? No. What do you, what do you guys drink here besides coffee? It's ridiculous. Bourbon? Beer. Oh, oh boy. Ooh. Oh. Bourbon beer. Cider. So, so, that makes sense. Okay. So pretty much everything. Pretty, pretty much. We're, we drink everything here. Hi. So this is a selfish question, but I share your daughter's name, and I'm Amazing. curious how you got it. How did I? How did we come to the name Marlo? Um, well, we were pretty sure it was that our child was going to be a boy. I was pretty sure of it, so I had a, like a great boy's name picked out, and then it wasn't a boy. Um, which like sent me into a whole thing, uh, being like, I don't want to raise a girl in this country. <laughs> My therapist is like, you get what you don't want. That's what happens. You didn't want it. You, and then that's what's going to happen to you. So I don't know. We, I, I think we, um, of course I love her now. Like, you know, you have them and then you're like, well, I can't imagine her being anything else, but, um, uh, I'm not answering your question at all. Um, I don't know. I think we just, we loved that name. It was a name that stuck out to us. Um, and honestly, we didn't have like a bunch of choices. We just, that was one that came in and, and then all the other ones we had talked about, we didn't like, and that, it just stuck. And also, um, her middle name is Alice. So it's Marlo Alice Cross. And I liked the ring poetically of Marlo Alice together, um, which was, Alice is a, is a very, uh, significant name on the matriarchal lineage side of my family. So running up through four generations of women on my mother's side. Thank you. Yep. Come on down. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm just wondering if you would talk more about, so you mentioned that you're engaging with white feminism and mm -hmm. like how it is not great. Um, so I'm wondering if you would talk more about that for mm -hmm. the wider audience. Mm -hmm. So so some of the things in, in a chapter that I specifically sort of talk about in the book, I talk about this ownership of the term, of saying that it's important for any of us to not only accept and 
and um, own the great things we have done in our life, um, the great ways in which we have existed, but the ways in which we have failed. And I think that this idea um, has only really, certainly in my work and my experience with Time's Up, uh, the idea of how even white feminism has pervaded within um, the entertainment industry in specific uh, has never really been able to come up or be talked about before because women were never really allowed to be in a room alone together devoid of the male perspective. So when we all started sitting down having meetings, trying to figure out what it was we wanted. This was before Time's Up. This is what Time's Up became. But um, it became very apparent in the room that devoid of that of, of men in, in that particular situation, we were just left to face each other. And it became pr very clear, very quickly, that 95% of the women in the room were either cis or queer, but they were white. And... Uh, and that the other voices had been predominantly left out of not only the, the conversations that were happening um, regarding uh, how things should be done, how things should be changed, but also just representative in a larger format of being left out of um, what TV shows were being made and movies and what content, like real representation behind the camera and in front of the camera, all of it. And... It's sad that that's what it took for, for the white women in my community to see that, to see that their sense of feminism had only ever really pertained to them and their experiences and never really reached across any different aisle or divide and said, okay, well, how are the women who are disabled or not white or any type of a marginal vo marginalized voice in our community, how are they not being represented in this room? And because of this massive shift, that conversation has now taken a center stage. And it is so much a part of all of the work that not only I do, but pretty much everyone that you, you see that's been associated with this movement and with the Time's Up organization has made that such an important part of their experience. That I've always talked about this idea that it's not enough for us to, to link arms, right? We have to keep reaching behind us and pulling women forward. And we have to remember who's being left out of the chain. And then we also have to hope that whoever's in the chain in front of us, that they're going to reach back and pull us forward. And that each and every one of us belongs here and belongs as part of the conversation. And that you can't have, you know, the full, the, the full wide periphery of what feminism is supposed to be, which is the equality of the sexes. It also is the equality of the genders, it is, the, it is the, you know, it is the equalities of the binaries. It's all of these things that have been left out of traditional conversations that surround representation. And so it's so important for each of us, especially as the white women, right, who have, who have felt like the marginalized person in any given room, who has felt like, well, I can't possibly, you can't possibly call me racist. You can't possibly call me X, Y, or Z, because look what I've been through. Look what I've done for other people. Look, look how I have been oppressed. We have to quell that. We have to put the defensiveness aside. And this is, this is only something I know and that I have learned over years and years of experience of having my non-white girlfriends help me see that. So this is not something that I was born to understand. It was something that I had to unlearn and then relearn again and realize that no matter how I was feeling, no matter how, you know, how much I felt like I didn't matter or wasn't being heard or wasn't, be chose, wasn't being chosen for the job, that there were so many other different types of women where at least I could get a foot in the door, they couldn't even get a foot in the building. <laughs> So we have to think about that. We have to constantly not get comfortable in our own narrative that we, that our suffering is the only suffering that matters and that feminism belongs to our, our type of healing only. And we have to remember that, um, that the most important thing we can do is to be mentors to other women, to bring them into the fold. I mean, anyone in here, no matter what your job is, you know, you have a, 
any one of us has any number of privileges, small or large, doesn't matter what you do. Um, you can remember that you can bring someone into your work, into your field, into a meeting in your office, at your job, give them a perspective, help them see something that they've never had access to before. And so I think for, for white women, for us in particular, our work can, being continued is to remember how we can bring everyone into that conversation and remember who we are leaving out. And always in any given space, this is like the main thing. We have to be able to have difficult conversations with non-white women without immediately becoming defensive. The def putting our defenses up first is the end of a dialogue. It becomes then our internal monologue of, of a coping mechanism, of being reset back to this old place of being afraid, of being accused, of being called something we don't believe we are. And everything has to be a dialogue, again, even if it's uncomfortable, even if it makes us feel terrible inside. It's, again, it's not meant to be particularly comfortable. But we have to keep that in mind and just remember that this work cannot be done without truly including everybody and without truly you know, listening and being open to, to the experiences of other people, even if that sometimes means, you know, be, at, because of something that we have done. I think our curiosity has to trump our defensiveness. And, and I make the case in the book that this really is part of what this era of ignition is, this idea of, of, you know, opening yourself up to a raw burning flame, essentially. And sometimes it's going to hurt. But that's the only way, you know, revolutions don't happen. They're not supposed to be easy. You can't uproot 200 years of a country's uh, beliefs and, and, and foundational problematic systems and, and expect that to be something that's simple. So if we really want to be a part of this larger change, especially as liberal women, as liberal men, people who think in those stratospheres, we have to, uh, we have to really be super engaged and, um, and, and ready right now for those, thing, for those difficult conversations. All right, thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Anybody else? <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, I am a student right now as well, just kind of trying to figure out everything. And things that I see on the news are pretty shocking and um, devastating in a lot of ways. And one thing I've always struggled with is how do you um, address the people that flat out try to discredit science, whether it's environmental, whether it's history? I mean, when there's proof and there's you know, hard evidence in their face, they still deny it completely. How do you, how do you work with those people? Boy, no one's ever asked me that. Is that, <laughs> you mean like in a personal? Or just, and like having a talk <coughs> with anybody without, you know, because these people, sometimes people in power, especially our president has said numerous things about how, you know, he doesn't believe in environmental change, how we are a part of it, and um, certain facts in history he's denied, and they just, and so he kind of, people that really support him also look for that, and I feel like a lot of people he has a lot of influence, so how, and he's not the only one, so, mm -hmm. I mean, if, if they're saying that, you know, how do you, how do you have a conversation with somebody that won't listen, I guess? Or I, I mean, I, I don't know, um, enough about, uh, scientific dialogues and what those arguments would be with those specific people, um, I think to, f to fully have, like, a full grasp on, what someone could do, but I would I would say equivalently that it would that it's like any argument we have with anyone, whether it's about politics, you know, um, whatever that may be. I think standing our ground is really important, and I think um, actively not writing people off and saying, "Well, they're they just believe this. They voted for Trump, so fuck them. I'm not talking to them anymore." My aunt Becky in Colorado or something. I don't, I don't have an aunt Becky in Colorado. Um, <laughs> But, you know, like, I think doing that is the wrong thing to do right now, and we have to be really engaged. Um, I, like, I can give you a, a, um, my own example, which is not science-based, but, uh, but 
religion and voting based slightly, but my, I have a cousin who's a fundamental, fundamentalist Christian who voted for Trump and who's a big Trump supporter, and I love her a lot, and I have been actively reaching out to her to have conversations about him and to say there's got to be certain things that we can all agree on. Right, like we can all, we all have to agree. We might, we might, we may never meet eye to eye on abortion. You know, there's some things where it I, that's okay, and that'll be like a fight forever. But when somebody separates children, hundreds and hundreds of children from their parents, and puts them in detention centers, and then loses track of the records of where they came from and who their parents are. And so there's no way to ever get them back with their parents again, forever orphaning these children and potentially ruining their lives. We have to all agree, conservative, liberal, that that's not acceptable. We don't do that in this country. And there has to be consequences for behavior like that. So for me, it's always about finding the, mutual, the, the, the thing you can mutually agree on and going from there. Um, Again, like, I'd, I wouldn't know how to argue with someone like Donald Trump. Like, I just, if I was in a room with him, it's just, you know, it's like arguing with a dying pigeon. I don't know. It just, like, well, sir, all right. Good luck to you. Um, but, but I think in our own personal lives, in our own personal um, uh, work with whoever we're talking, whoever we might be talking to about and having those conversations, I think finding the one thing that we can agree on and then expanding out from there and continuing down the line of, again, going back to that idea of the difficult dialogues and not ever letting it become a monologue. Because if we're over here going, well, I know this to be true about science and climate change and I know all this to be true, like why aren't these people, why are they being stupid and why aren't they coming over here and listening to me? We've, we've, got, we've got to find the center and move out from there. That's that's what I think. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I think we have time for like two more questions. <clears throat> Hi. So um, I was at dinner with two of the smartest women I know. Um, and one of the conversations that we were having at dinner was about raising daughters mm -hmm. um, and sort of that struggle of like wanting to make them the strongest, most like tough and aggressive and intelligent woman you can have. And then your daughter is coming and like only wanting to wear Disney princess dresses. And while not wanting to squash that and be like, no, you have to be a computer scientist. Um, at the same time, like recognizing and valuing their interests and their passions and that like makeup and dresses and feeling pretty and feeling good about yourself is not any less than important than being a computer scientist. Um, how are you thinking about the conversations that you want to have with Marlo as she grows up where you sort of acknowledge and empower her as the individual woman that she wants to be mm -hmm. while at the same time encouraging her to uh, pursue things outside of what society tells her that she can be and fulfill? So uh, this is so interesting because I have definitely found myself uh, like unconsciously but also probably semi-consciously like going through her drawer and pulling out all the pink onesies and like putting them in a trash bag. Just being like, we don't wear pink in this house. Um, says the lady with a pink cover on her book. Okay. Uh, but it, but this is... It, I, this conversation is so interesting, right? Because I think it goes back to this idea of controlling the definition of feminism and controlling the outcome of what any woman or girl's life is going to be, but also what it should be, what the value of it should be. I had a woman a couple nights ago in a, t in a city who said, you know, she's raising her daughter. She's, she's been a feminist and she was very young. And, you know, she's, her daughter is now going into college. And she's like, I really get the sense that my, my that she's going to, you know, she's probably going to have kids and get married young and be like a full-time mom. And I'm grappling with sort of, and she said, not really go, where did I go wrong, but how, why was this the outcome out of everything that was offered to her? And, you know, I am having a lot of feelings about that. And, and I, I reminded her, as I will say to you and to, to anybody here, that this, that the important thing about feminism and raising feminist daughters is the freedom of choice. 
that they can do whatever they want to do. And that includes being a stay-at-home mother. That includes running for president. That includes being both. That includes being transgender. That includes being anything that they want to be without the limits of our own feelings for them projected onto their livelihood. And so it's so important that when we're raising them, we do more observing and more listening than we do directing and telling. That we, we watch and we see what they need, what they are telling us that they want, what they are telling us they feel that they are, who they like, what interests them, what turns them on, any of those things, <clears throat> as opposed to dictating to them what we think those things should be. So I think keep those, keep that in mind always, um, and remember that that the important, the most important message we can send to our daughters is that they have the true freedom of choice to really be anything that they want to be, not just the things that we want for them and what we want them to be. Even if that's feminism, like even if we want them to be versions of us and rocket scientists and poets and, you know, we have to remember that that's about us. That's about our own id, our own egos stepping in and trying to provide for them. But ultimately, the best thing we can give for any of our daughters and our sons too is that freedom. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Yes, Perfect. hello. Hi. I'm, I'm here. I'm Hi. here for you. Um, I'm curious what latest pop culture phenomenons are most interesting to you. Oh my God. <clears throat> Hang on, let me text Roxanne Gay real quick. What pop culture phenomenons are cool, will make me look cool? I was just going to say the college scandal. Um, oh my God, what a shit show. Um, I mean, part of me kind of feels like, part of me kind of feels like, how was anyone sh shocked by that? Like, I. Nobody is, right? Although we're acting very shocked, but I think that we had to have known that stuff like that, like I think that's the, the tip of the iceberg. I think there's so much more um, corrupt stuff going on in academia. Um, I think it's just extra salacious and juicy because it involves, you know, two actresses. So um, I think it's a... Uh, I think it's it's a pretty wild time right now when you're seeing things like that exposed at that high up of a level. But, um, but that's the world that we live in. That's the world of privilege and access. And I do think it's interesting though that like two of the biggest like actresses known for doing these like e exceptional dramas like Desperate Housewives are the one that got foiled into this. I feel like they're like in their own subplot. <laughs> they're like on their own show right now. Like surely. Shonda Rhimes is going to go make this a show and we're all going to fucking watch it. We know that. We're going to watch it and we're going to love it. We're going to like, you know, root for the villainess. It's the title of my next book. Um, all right, you guys. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, this is such a joy and um, I will be uh, up here, Yes. I'll be up here doing magic tricks. No, um, I'll be up here signing books. Uh, if you guys haven't got one yet, um, grab it in the back and happy to say hi and sign your book. Thanks.